I came to realize that the idea of aging is something that's not hardwired into us. It's not in our genetic code. It's something that's malleable. It's something that we can influence. We can speed it up and we can also slow it down. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. What if I told you that it's possible to slow down your rate of aging? Are you curious what it takes to live a healthier, longer life? Today's episode is on longevity health. We break down the factors that contribute to longevity and the exciting science behind it. Our special guest today is Chris Miraboli. Chris Miraboli, founder and CEO of Novos and blogger at Slow My Age, is an entrepreneur and longevity expert who has slowed his biological pace of aging by one third. After surviving a brain tumor as a teenager, Chris has devoted himself to avoiding disease. With aging being the number one risk factor for chronic illness, he set his sights on its biological causes about a decade ago which has manifested as Novos and Slow My Age. Hello, Chris. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm doing great. Yeah, getting a lot done. Uh, weather's nice, so nothing nothing to complain about. How about you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Are you also based in like California or where are you based? No, I'm in South Florida, not too far from Miami, though I'm originally a New Yorker uh, my whole life, but during COVID, I came down. Okay. Okay. That's why you're like, weather's great. I was like, "Mm, today's kind of cloudy here. (laughs) Okay. So why don't you start by telling us your story of this journey? Like what sparked this journey of exploring health and longevity? So it's, uh, it starts from an early age. I'll, I'll keep it rather quick though. So when I was 12 years old, I started getting into health and wellness. I saw an issue of men's health magazine on the newsstand and I was inspired by the people in that magazine. I wanted to get into good shape. And uh, and so I started exercising and reading about diet and eating a healthier diet and so on. And then when I was 16 years old, it came as that much more of a surprise to me, considering how healthy I was living, to have suddenly had a seizure. And it turned out that it was caused by a brain tumor. And it was there's there were no signs prior to that event that I, I may have had one, but it was larger than a golf ball, so it oh had been gosh. growing for a while. And they had to do emergency surgery. And fortunately, uh, other than missing half of my brain, I'm just kidding about that. But uh, fortunately, other than removing the the tumor, everything has has worked out. Uh, but it did transform my thinking and perspective on life and uh, changed my perspective on health. So from an early age, I was acutely aware of how fragile life is and uh, the impact that a chronic illness can have and how it feels to lay in a hospital bed not knowing if you're going to wake up the next day or not. And I never wanted to go through that again. So I was interested in long-term health at a very early age, something that most people don't contemplate until they're in their later years or Even then, many don't contemplate that. Uh, So that planted the seed for me, which eventually kind of uh, blossomed into what I'm now doing with my life. Yeah, no, that is an insane story and so young. And and also the fact that you got into health at like 12 years old. I mean, that's that's different. (laughs) But tell me about that journey of like, was it just for yourself then all those years of like just learning how to live long for yourself? Or and, and at one point did you just start decide to start a company around it? Yeah. So you know, if we fast forward into uh, my college years and and shortly after, I, I went to NYU Stern. I, I studied finance, economics, and international business. I, I started um, a company of my own after winning the NYU uh, business plan competition, and so I was very entrepreneurial. Uh, but it had nothing to do with health. What was that first company? The, the first company was a company called Hotlist. So it was a social network. It was at the time that Facebook was opening up to the world. Uh, at, at first, Facebook was college exclusive. And so I wanted to restore that exclusivity to the college market, but then also focus more on real world social activities to get people out and doing things with each other and interacting and meeting each other. And so that was that was the focus on uh, that, that app. Um, it was actually a website to start, and then we were one of the first mobile apps because that was right around when iTunes uh, launched the App Store or Apple launched the App Store and, and so on. 
but all in my personal life, I was still very into health. And so I was in the gym every day. I was going for runs four, five, six days a week. Uh, I was watching my diet and, and so on. Uh, but I didn't really get into the scientific side of things quite yet. So this is right now my early to mid 20s. I'm 40 now. So at that time, it was more about reading the magazines and uh, you know getting tips from friends and going to the gym and so on. It was in my later 20s when I started to become aware of the idea of biohacking, as people call it now, and uh, the supplementation and trying to make tweaks to your lifestyle to accomplish a specific goal. And I found myself constantly going into the scientific research. So uh, just getting deeper and deeper. My curiosity was getting deeper and there weren't typically answers to the questions I was asking myself. So I would have to go on PubMed, which is like the government website for all of the scientific studies. Uh, it's an index of scientific studies. And then you could start doing searches and learning from those studies. And so that's when I started to really get into the scientific side of things. And that's when I came across a paper called The Hallmarks of Aging, which came out more than 10 years ago now. And it was essentially a, a summary of all of the research to that point of the reasons why we get older. So looking at animal studies and human studies, and then looking at the biological mechanisms or the microscopic things that go wrong as we age, which actually leads to us having higher incidences of disease and looking older and passing away. All of these things are are conspiring against us on the microscopic scale. And reading that paper really opened my eyes. It, and that's when things really started to change for me. Because first of all, I came to realize that the idea of aging is something that's not hardwired into us. It's not in our genetic code. It's something that's malleable. It's something that we can influence. We can speed it up and we can also slow it down. Everyone knows we can speed it up. When you think about some, someone smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, you look at them and they look older. They do tend to pass away much earlier and so on. But not everyone realizes that you can actually do the opposite. You can slow down your aging too by taking the right steps um, it, in your lifestyle and your routine. And yeah. so when I saw that and then learned about these hallmarks, fast forward a few more years, I started networking with scientists. And that's when I decided that there was something that I could do to try to impact aging. Mm, that's so fascinating. And it's true. Most of us take aging as like, like something we have to live with and you can't really control it. But you're saying there are ways to speed it up and slow it down. And that's the key. It's like, all you have to do is learn those factors, right? Right. Yeah. So scientists and uh, longevity enthusiasts are really looking for ways to possibly even reverse aspects of aging, or maybe one day we can reverse whole body aging. Uh, a lot of enthusiasts in the field refer to something called longevity escape velocity. That's the point at which scientific innovation is adding more years to our life then time is elapsing. In other words, we are innovating faster than time. So if you are alive once we hit escape of velocity, um, even if you're 90 years old, uh, the science is keeping up with every year that you are, are alive and it's extending the lifespan. Uh, wow. Right now, we're, we're not even close to that. Right yeah. now, what we're much closer to, and, and anyone who tells you otherwise is really just hyping things up and it, it, we're not there. Uh, what we're focused on, at least at my company, is, is the really practical, realistic things that we can do, but looking through the lens of scientific research to see what is actually impacting our aging versus what is a fad or what is some sort of scam that people are pushing or something that is just steeped in tradition, but is not actually shown to have an impact on the aging process. Hey everyone, as we get into back to school season, keeping up with healthy eating can be a challenge, but Green Chef is here to make it simple and delicious. Thanks to Green Chef for sponsoring today's podcast. I'm super excited for my first box to arrive and I can't wait to try their wide variety of meals that fit every lifestyle, whether you're gluten-free, vegan, or trying out keto. 
Did you know that Green Chef is the first certified organic meal kit company? That means each box is packed with the freshest organic produce and premium proteins delivered right to your doorstep. Plus, they make it easy with meals that are ready to whip up in just 25 minutes. And if you didn't know, Green Chef is part of the HelloFresh family, which means they bring a wide array of meal plans catered to your clean eating habits. As someone who's enjoyed HelloFresh in the past, I'm excited to try out Green Chef. Now get ready for this amazing offer. Go to greenchef.com slash TLL class for 50% off your first box and 50 free credits with ClassPass. That's code TLL class at greenchef.com slash TLL class to get 50% off your first box plus 50 free ClassPass credits. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. Don't miss out on this deal. Before we get further, I want to lay it out. So what is, we, you told us you're real age 40. What is your biological age? So it, it really depends on how we test, right? Like every, everything's a little bit more complex than, than it sounds at, at first. Right. Maybe a range then? Yeah. So, so the average of my uh, biological age output from uh, almost two dozen different markers that I track is minus 14.4 years. So at 40, that would put me at, at around 26 biologically. Now, what does that actually mean? I mean, I don't look like a 26-year-old. So there are aspects of aging that this is not accounting for. But there are aspects of aging that this most certainly is accounting for. And that's related to, for example, my epigenome, which is which genes are turned on and off. And this changes as you age. And it's very important because our, our uh, genetic expression really impacts how well our cells function, how well our organs function, and how fast we are perceived to age, even on the visual uh, aesthetic side of things, how fast uh, we're aging. It's uh, correlated with my morbidity risk, so the risk that I get cancer or heart disease or diabetes or Alzheimer's and so on, it's correlated with my mortality risk. Other metrics that I've measured as part of this, this average are things like my VO2 max. So the maximum oxygen my body can consume as I exercise, that declines as you get older, but there are things you can do to keep that elevated. So uh, so as I mentioned, it's minus 14.4 years. There are some outliers, for example, my telomere age. This is uh, These are the protective end caps of our chromosomes. They protect our DNA, essentially. My telomeres are that of someone 29 years younger than me. So almost uh, a nine-year-old practically. Uh, But then there are others that are are not as extreme. Uh, I'm looking at my numbers right now. Um, The least extreme of them all is a epigenetic test called Grim Age. And this is one of the most accurate tools that scientists have to determine the risk of of morbidity um, and death. It, it's in the name, Grim Age, right? Like, uh, and um, and that one is minus 6.4 years. So that would put me at about you know, 33 and a half years old, according to that measure. Um, so we can't, we can't trust one completely. Right. There's so many different tests that you can take, right? Exactly. I guess for you, what in your body do you value the most when you're trying to reverse the aging? Like, is it all of them? Like there must be a priority list, right? Like the top three that you care about. Yeah, what you're getting at is the point of, there's there's a few factors to keep in mind. One is like what measurement is going to have um, the biggest impact on your overall health or at least is tracking your overall health the best. Right. I would say the epigenome is arguably one of the better ways to track your overall health. Um, second is then even within the epigenome, you have to question how accurate and precise is the specific algorithm that's being used to measure your epigenetic or biological age. And there are three generations of epigenetic clocks. The first generation, these came out about a decade ago. It's uh, the, the researcher who invented it is uh, famous for this work. It's called the Horvath clock. Uh, invented by a UCLA scientist uh, named Steve Horvath. And uh, this clock was specifically designed to estimate how old you are chronologically. So looking at your epigenome, can we guess how old you are? Now, that was really novel at the time, and it was a great idea, but scientists quickly realized that this doesn't provide that much relevance in the medical and biological field because 
you've got your license to tell you when you were born, right? Like you have your birth certificate for that. You don't need an expensive blood test to tell you how old you are, unless it's something like forensics where they're trying to get a clue in a, a crime and they're trying to figure out how old the perpetrator was from like their blood sample or something, right? Other than that, we have licenses. So what we actually want to figure out is biological age. And that is, again, the morbidity risk mortality risk and quality of life metrics. So this would be your ability to like your, your grip strength, your sit stand ability, unassisted, your gait speed, all of those types of things that really play a role in, in our quality of life as we get older. And so second generation tests started to look at that. That's what, for example, the grim age clock is that I just mentioned. That's a second generation clock. Third generation clock is what I hold at the highest level. Um, this is something that my company has licensed from Columbia and Duke University researchers to make it more freely available. But uh, a third generation test is actually looking at your trajectory of aging right now. So for example, if your result was one, that means for every one chronological year, you're aging one year biologically. If it was 1.1, you're aging 10% faster. Or if it, as in my case, is 0.69, that implies that I'm aging 31% slower than the average person. And the, the beauty of this is that it's, it's uh, not immutable. This is malleable. This is something that your lifestyle is going to impact uh, the pace at which you're, you're aging. And believe it or not, only about 10% of your rate of aging in your, your lifespan is uh, based on your genetics. The vast majority of it is actually your lifestyle. And I think I'm a case in point of this. I had a brain tumor and yet I still have and, and, and traumatic events like that, stressful events to the body can accelerate aging. So the fact that I was able to get it down to what it is now, is just a case in point example of how powerful our lifestyles can be for our rate of aging. Oh yeah. You definitely had that obstacle early on that it's a factor that you had to probably try much harder to, to to reduce your aging. One other quick question about these tests, are they just blood tests or are they kind of a combination of like fitness tests and things like that? So the third generation one is a blood test. Um, it's very simple. So it's just a finger prick and then you, you spread that uh, blood on an index card about the size of a quarter and then you mail that in. There are other epigenetic tests out there that I would just caution the listener to be aware of, like saliva-based tests, although they're more convenient, they are far less accurate and precise. And the, the analogy I like to give is, like, if you were trying to lose weight, how helpful would a scale be if each time you stepped on it, it varied by 10 pounds plus or minus, and you have no idea how much it's varying by each time? You wouldn't get very far on your weight loss journey. So it's the same when it comes to a longevity, long, a longevity journey. Mm, okay, so you're saying blood tests is more accurate than saliva tests. Yes. I mean, it's amazing to me that even a prick is enough to, to tell you all that information. That's insane to me. <laughs> I thought you had to like run on treadmills and do all these other things, like hook up, hook yourself up to the system. Yeah, which 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 is great. And I, I've done all of those things as well, right? So I, I would say like, if you're really into it, like I am, then uh, you, you try all of these other tests and then you see if they're in agreement with each other. So for example, uh, what you're referring to uh, when, when you have like the mask on and you've got the wires on your chest and so on, that's measuring uh, VO2 max that I mentioned earlier. Oh. And so that for me um, implies 30% slower aging, which is like right in the neighborhood of the 31% slower aging that the epigenetic test found. So the more of these markers that I find that are like closely grouped together in terms of the um, association of a biological age, the more confident I feel in those results. Very cool. All right. So now I'm sure everyone is curious. Let's get into like the practical lifestyle guidance. You're here. You're the expert. Like what are the things that everyday people can do <laughs> to improve or to slow down their uh, age aging rate? Yes. So, you know, there's a lot of health advice out there. And what I would say is that simply because something seems to be healthy or provides a short-term benefit that's associated with health, does not mean it's actually good for longevity or lifespan. I'll give you an example, a quick, simple example. Uh, someone might say, you know, 
becoming a marathoner or a triathlete or something like that's the pinnacle of human achievements, physical achievements, right? Like, uh, but ultimately those types of events, ultra endurance events and, and, uh, longer events like that can actually lead to excess inflammation in the body. And that can actually have negative effects on, for example, cardiovascular outcomes. So just because something seems to be healthy doesn't mean that it's actually tuned for this, the specific goal of slowing down aging. So with that in mind, uh, I would say that there, there's a number of categories to consider and we can dig into any of these yeah, that you care to. Yeah, get into it. Uh, yep. All right. So, so you've got diet and for diet, it comes down to not only what foods you're eating and the quantity of those foods, but also the timing of those meals. Um, second would be activity. So how much activity are you engaging in? Uh, like I said, you can do too much, but for most people, it's that they're doing too little exercise. Um, next is recovery. So especially if you're exercising, but even if you're not, you need adequate recovery and the best way to recover is sleep. So when it comes to sleep, you need to focus not only on the quantity of sleep, how long you're asleep for, but arguably as important or more important is the quality of that sleep. Another factor to consider is psychology. Everything from stress management to uh, optimism to having a purpose in life, all of these have been associated with longer lifespans and better health spans, so reduction in risk of many different diseases. Connected to that is relationships. So, you know, as humans, we are highly social creatures and uh, we, we can't deny that about ourselves. So having positive relationships in our lives has been shown to have uh, positive effects on our lifespans and our health spans. And the magic number uh, is to have three close, positive friends in your life. And to try to, of course, minimize any sort of toxic relationships, but having three people you consider you're close to that you can talk to about practically anything and they keep you in high spirits and so on, that's the magic number. If you're going beyond that, like, hey, maybe it's a marginal improvement, but also keep in mind if you have too many people, then you might not be as close to those people as you would be if you had that core group of three friends. And then beyond that, I would say other considerations are supplements uh, and even prescription drugs. But um, for most people, prescription drugs are, are too far out there, but there are enthusiasts in the field um, that are using specific prescriptions that have been shown in animal studies, um, even even primates, for example, to be able to significantly extend lifespan and health span. All right, time for another short break. This episode is proudly brought to you by Lola V, the award-winning hair care line founded by Jennifer Aniston. Introducing Lola V, clean plant-powered products for every hair type and texture. And a special treat for you, for a limited time, you get an exclusive 15% off your entire order at lolav.com. Just use the code LAVENDARE at checkout. I've been using Lola V's restorative shampoo, conditioner, and glossing detangler in my hair care routine for smooth, healthy hair. I appreciate their natural plant-based ingredients and signature scent, which fuses citrus, rose, lemongrass, and green tea. Unlock Jennifer Aniston approved hair at lolav.com. As our loyal listeners, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use the code LAVENDARE at checkout. That's 15% off your order at lolavie.com with promo code LAVENDARE. Please note that you can only use one promo code per order and discounts cannot be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. Your hair will thank you. I kind of want you to go deeper into them. Let's let's go into like the first two, right? Diet and movement. Like, let's get specific. What are the things that you found? Like what we eat and when we eat? How do we figure those things out? Yeah, so, so when it comes to diet, uh, I'm going to piss off a lot of people with some of the things I'm going to say. There's so many confusing things that we hear. We hear like some people are like, eat more vegetarian. Some people eat more meat. It's like it, there's always these like trends of what is the new healthy and it's so confusing for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. And, and people are religious about it. Right. So they will argue nonstop that their way is the best way. And also that their way applies to everyone in every circumstance. And if you're going to argue that, like, 
that's that's I mean I think we know it's ridiculous, right? Like uh, you can't argue that uh, for somebody who's who's concerned about animal welfare that a carnivore diet is better for them, right? Like that's not a health outcome, but that's just a point that like everyone has different values and uh, things that they need to emphasize. And so uh, if you're a bodybuilder, for example, trying to get as as big as you can, as swole as you can get, you're going to have a different diet than what I'm going to recommend right now, right? So yeah. my recommendation is based on longevity to slow down aging, reduce the risk of disease, and to I- I- increase lifespan. And the diet that time and time again is shown in countless studies to be the best for this is the Mediterranean style diet. Now, the Mediterranean style diet has variation to it. I mean, you can look at different regions of the world, like um, the diet in Okinawa, Japan is not technically the Mediterranean diet, but it has a lot of similarities with the Mediterranean diet. So I'm encompassing all of those when I say this. And the foundation of these diets is that they are largely plant-based. They have a lot of uh, legumes and beans, mushrooms, um, a healthy amount of of, uh, fruits in there as well. They have a lot of seafood. They have a moderate to low amount of red meats, and they have a moderate amount of poultry. They have low, very low levels of, or, or if at any, if at all, uh, any sort of processed foods. Um, they are high in healthy fats like olive oil, for example. Um, avocado is also a, a healthy fat. They're getting omega threes through that seafood that they're consuming, uh, and so it's all foods fresh from the earth. They're getting a lot of those phytonutrients. Um, these are plant based nutrients that are not even that well studied oftentimes. A lot of these are just like, um, it's not like the commonly well-studied vitamins and minerals like vitamin A and the Bs and C, D, E, K, and so on. These are some things that people are not necessarily even aware of, like quercetin Mm -hmm. and fisetin and EGCG and all of these things, right? So you're getting dosages of those from uh, eating all of these plant-based foods and overall, that that is arguably the the healthiest. Now, I mentioned earlier, it's also about quantity of food and the timing. Now, the nice thing about this diet is that, first of all, it is something that people have a much easier time adhering to than other diets. You've got extreme diets out there, like a ketogenic diet is quite extreme. Uh, I would argue a carnivore diet is quite extreme for most people, where you can only have meat and you can't have anything else. Uh, so all of these, like, these these diets that are at the extremes, people tend to have a harder time maintaining over the long term. And you're also running risks of nutrient deficiencies or getting too much of a given um, macronutrient. For example, too much saturated fat is common in ketogenic diets. Not saying it's always the case, but it tends to be common in those diets. Cholesterol levels tend to go up significantly. Now that's, people argue that cholesterol might not be as as big of an issue as, as um, once thought, but until it's proven not to be, I would consider it something that you want to keep lower on the lower ends, especially ApoB and LDL cholesterol. So anyway, it's something that you can comply with. And, um, and then you also don't feel like overindulging with it, right? So when you're eating these whole foods, like imagine having like a, a, a plate of fish and broccoli and spinach and olive oil um, and then maybe some like dark chocolate with some berries and stuff after that meal, you're not like starving for other foods, right? When you compare that to the calorically dense nutrient poor foods that are processed foods, people overeat them because they're not getting the nutrients they need and they're hyper palatable. So people just have these cravings for it. So in terms of the amount, it's the best. And then in terms of the timing, your audience may have heard of the idea of uh, time-restricted feeding. Some people call it intermittent fasting. It's not exactly the precise term for it. Right. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. So technically, intermittent fasting is when you are are not only timing the meals, but then you're also eating fewer calories than you otherwise would be. If you're eating the same amount, you're just cramming it into a smaller eating window, which is what most people do. That's technically time-restricted feeding. So you're saying it's it's not about the calories. It's, it's just about restricting it to a time frame. 
There's uh, scientific arguments on both sides. So some would say that the that the benefits of the intermittent fast in and of itself is due to uh, the fewer calories that people tend to consume when they are um, eating in a smaller window. But then there's also the question of, for example, um, the circadian rhythm and uh, the effects that the circadian rhythm have on our metabolisms. And so, for example, if you're eating carbs early in the morning, your body is going to process them better and you're going to require less insulin and the blood glucose won't get as high as if you're eating those same carbs at night. So there is something to the timing in whatever eating window you choose. So the most ideal, and I don't personally uh, do this uh, for the matter of convenience for me, but the most ideal would be to start your eating earlier in the day and to end it earlier in the evening and maybe have that as like an eight hour eating window. So, you know, maybe that's like 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or something, right? Um, and to have more of your carbs earlier in the day, especially because you're going to be physically active earlier in the day. And then at, at night and in the evening, you're not moving much and the blood glucose will go higher as a result. What I do personally is I find myself eating more like 11 to 7 partly because I find myself super focused early in the morning and I just have like a, a black coffee. And um, and when I eat a lot early in the morning, I'm just not as productive with my work. So I, I delay it a little bit. So do you just do that in two meals or do you, like does the number of meals matter or or not? I think that for, there's there's no definitive answer to that. And I think that although you'll you'll have some people online saying you want the fewest meals possible, I don't think that, that there's any evidence that that's actually uh, true in terms of you know health spans and lifespans. Um, I think that as long as you, if you're going you know, 16 hours without food, you have a long period where your blood glucose is lower, you're not secreting hormones like insulin, your body is engaging in autophagy to, to get calorie needs and so on to keep you fueled and awake and, and so on. So um, I think that it's probably perfectly fine to have uh, multiple meals in there. I don't see evidence that there wouldn't be, um, that it wouldn't be good. I personally, um, I'll break my fast with a smoothie that I'll have because I'll, I'll work out in the morning. So it'll be high in protein, but I, I typically use a plant-based protein, which is lower in an amino acid called methionine, which is associated in many different animal species with accelerating aging. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the reason I go with a plant-based protein. I add to that, you know, mushroom powder and uh, some creatine and um, celery, um, carrot, um, some frozen kale or spinach, a handful of things. I blend that up. I start, I break my fast with that. Then a couple of hours later, I'll have a meal. I'll have a lunch. I'll typically probably about two hours or so after that have um, a small snack. Like it might be, um, you know, something that has a modest amount of protein so I can hit the amount of protein I need for the day to maintain my muscles. Um, and then I will have a dinner meal close to around seven o'clock. Okay. Okay. That seems pretty reasonable. And it, this kind of brings me to the next question is I wanted to ask about your daily or weekly routines. Like what, what are the things that you do? Like whether it's habits, routines, anything that help you with your health and longevity? First of all, I, I'm much more strict on the weekdays than I am on the weekends. So the weekends I'll, I'll, you know, you know, live life more and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll cheat with that, you know, bowl of pasta or something. Right. But, um, but I'll also make sure that I always couple it with something healthy like vegetables. Right. So I'm, I'm never going on a binge, just eating totally unhealthy things. I'm always like counterbalancing it a, a little bit with at least something healthy. Um, and then I'll also try to exercise portion control. So even if I'm having that pasta, maybe I'll split it with someone or, Maybe I'll skip the dessert because I had the pasta and, and so on. So that that's the weekend where I'm not really engaged in routine as much. Um, during the week, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I have like the same routine day in and day out, right? Okay. So what is that routine? Let's start from Sunday night. Um, so beginning the work week, uh, I'm getting ready for work. So um, in the evening, I, I have in my home... Um, uh, almost all of the light bulbs I've switched out to be the Philips Hue light bulbs. So these are the LED bulbs that can change color and they, you can control them from Alexa or from your phone. And so I have them set like during the day to be bright white, 
you know, with the blue hue to it. But then uh, as we get closer to evening, I'll have them change to yellow and then orange. And then when I'm very close to bedtime, about 30 minutes before bedtime, they'll tr change to red. That'll be a signal, first of all, to me, all right, it's almost bedtime. I should stop using my electronic devices or whatever, start to uh, calm down. And then it's also good for me and my circadian rhythm because uh, bright lights and especially blue light is going to prevent your body from releasing melatonin, which we need to sleep soundly through the night. And the red light doesn't have nearly as much of an effect on that, uh, especially if they're dim. So I'm already now starting to get into the hormonal state of sleep. And so the melatonin is starting to, to be pumped. Uh, I get into bed on, a, on an ideal night. I will uh, meditate for about 10 minutes um, just laying in bed. And then once I'm done with that, I will just close my eyes and I'm asleep within, according to my aura ring, uh, typically within five to 10 minutes. So I fall asleep very quickly. I sleep soundly through the night and I don't wake up with an alarm. I have an alarm just as a fail safe. It, it gives me peace of mind, but uh, I don't I don't need an alarm. And I think that that's important because if you need an alarm to wake you up, that means your body is not fully restored yet. It wants right. to sleep more. And so a practice that I encourage, um, I actually, uh, Vogue magazine interviewed me for this, um, talking about sleep. You can find the article online. Uh, I, I've suggested to people that each night they go to sleep about 30 minutes earlier until they get to the point where they're waking up naturally without the alarm. And then after that, they might be able to go to sleep a little bit later because they've caught up on some sleep. But like that is where they'll eventually figure out like what their body truly needs. And sleep, first of all, is very important for longevity. Uh, when we're sleeping, our bodies are repairing themselves. So we've got like the glymphatic system that was just discovered a few years ago, which is where our brains are really being cleaned out of substances, waste product that accumulates uh, during the day. And our lymphatic system, our lymph nodes are clearing out bodies of waste product. And so better sleep is associated with lower risks of Alzheimer's disease and dementia and cardiovascular disease, diabetes, better blood sugar control, better metabolism, and so on. And if that's not enough, I mean, we all know we feel so much better. We're, we're like different people the day after a good night of sleep, right? Like com compare yourself to the, you know, the morning after a good night of sleep versus the morning after a terrible night of sleep. It's like night and day. We're two different people. And the way we uh, experience life is completely different. So I think that it's just critically important for people to emphasize sleep. And when you, when you get good sleep, you're that much more in control of the food choices that you make. So back to the original point about the importance of diet, you're that much more physically active when you have a good night of sleep. So you're going to burn more calories and then we can talk about physical activity, but you will be that much more physically active. Um, and you'll probably be that much more connected with your loved ones and so on. So they're all it, like related with each other. Right. But I think that sleep is a cornerstone that's oftentimes neglected. Right. All right. So the next day I, uh, I, I wake up again without the alarm. Um, I'll get up, I'll, I'll have two glasses of water. Um, in both of them, I'll pour in what's called light salt, L-I-T-E. Um, it's it's a combination, and this is the salt I tend to use on my meals as well. It's 45% sodium, 55% potassium. Oh, interesting. The uh -huh. vast majority of people, upwards of 97% of people, according to the NHANES scientific study, are um, have insufficient intakes of potassium. And uh, this is an electrolyte that is integral to every single cell in our body, so our brains. It's the sodium-potassium pump, if you remember from high school biology. So you need adequate uh, potassium levels, and you need to counterbalance all of the sodium that we're consuming, especially with processed foods and dining out. There's tons of sodium. So anyway, I, I, that's the reason I use that salt. Um, and the reason I put in, the, in my water in the morning is that you will absorb water far better. You'll be far better hydrated if you have electrolytes in your water. Now you can buy expensive San Pellegrino water to do that, but like if you're going to have glass bottles of water for every single you know uh, uh, time you drink water, it, it can add up very quickly. So uh, I just use filtered water, and then I put the electrolytes back in with that salt, just a pinch of it, uh, and that's what I start with. And then I'll have a, a cup of black coffee. I'll start getting dressed and ready for a workout. 
And then depending on the day of the week, I have a different workout plan. So on Mondays, for example, uh, I'll go out for a run about two and a half miles, um, moderate pace, you know, roughly like a 730 mile pace. And I'll then uh, weight lift, I'll do chest and triceps. That run in the morning is the same that I'll also do on Wednesday, Friday. Um, and then on Wednesday and Friday, I'll do uh, back and biceps. And on Friday, I'll do shoulders. Um, and then my other weightlifting day has been on Sunday for deadlifts. So getting legs and just full body strength. Um, and then a couple of other days of the week, I'm, I'm exercising, doing more cardio. So a goal that I set for myself um, for now that I'm 40 years old, I, I turned 40 a couple of weeks ago, uh, was to run the fastest mile of my life. So to outdo the 19, 20 year old version of Chris. And so uh, I'm within a few seconds of that. So right now I'm running um, almost five minutes and 30 seconds for a mile. So on Saturday, that's when I like push myself to run that. And then after I, I run that fast mile, then I'll do interval training. And interval training is like when you like run as hard as you can, or at least 90% as hard as you can uh, for depends on the duration, but anywhere from 15 seconds to maybe two to three minutes. Um, and then you take a couple of minutes to walk and, and rest and recover and then do it again for between six and eight reps. Typically, um, the value of that is that it's very good at increasing your VO two max. And I mentioned VO two max before, but VO two max is actually strongly correlated with lifespan. People with higher VO2 maxes have a significantly lower risk of death at any point in time than people with lower VO2 maxes. And there seems to be no limit to it. So the higher you can maintain your VO2 max as you age, um, the better you're going to most likely fare uh, for, for longevity. What, are, what about interval training makes the VO2 max I increase? Or what, what, is it the way you breathe when you're doing that kind of workout? Yeah, it's the it's the intensity of it. So uh, VO2 it max is the maximum volume of oxygen that your body can utilize in a given point uh, period of time. And so if you're just jogging, your body doesn't go into anaerobic respiration, right? You're in aerobic respiration. So aerobic respiration is when you're using your body's fat stores to fuel you predominantly. You're always using a little bit of sugar, a little bit of fat, but predominantly the fat. Um, when you then push yourself really hard like this, um, your body now needs to tap into um, anaerobic respiration. So it doesn't have enough oxygen to be able to fuel the muscles. And so um, that's when you're burning more of the carbs, the glycogen um, in your muscles. And it's just really hard on the body and intense. Now for the your listeners who want to lose fat, don't worry. Just because you're doing anaerobic respiration and burning carbs doesn't mean that you aren't burning fat. In fact, um, uh, high intensity interval training is one of the best ways to burn fat. It's just that, uh, you know, after you're recovering and slowing down, the body is now leveraging that fat and, and pulling from your fat stores. It makes sense. So when you're doing things like the HIIT workouts where you feel like you're dying, <laughs> that, that you're saying that's good because that is increasing the maximum oxygen that our body can can hold. Yep. Yep. So, so our mitochondria are, are the power plants of our cells. And so, um, they are, are converting the uh, calories that we eat into energy so that the cell can function and by extension, then the tissue and the, the organs. So like our skeletal muscle is being powered by these mitochondria. And when yeah. you're exercising, you're putting stress on those mitochondria and that stress, if it's the right dose, it's called a hormetic stressor. So a hormetic stressor, also known as a process called hormesis, is when you put a certain amount of stress in your body that your body then comes back even stronger than before. Now, if you overdo it, if you overdo the stressors on your body, then it's no longer hormetic and it's actually going to make you weaker in the end and cause excess damage. So that's where something like doing ultra endurance, if you're pushing yourself too hard, like maybe you actually go beyond the hormetic threshold and you're having excess inflammation and causing damage. But right. if you're doing something like high intensity interval training, that's where you're really improving your cardiovascular health, your muscle health, your mitochondrial health, and so on. Yeah, no, this is very interesting because it there it gives some clarity on like what type of exercises are actually helpful for our longevity because there's so many different types. Can you speak to other 
I, I, I guess other types like cardio, yoga, Pilates, like high intensity, low intensity, swimming, you know, are, <laughs> sure. are some types of exercises better than others? So first of all, what, what I would say is that um, there's a Pareto's principle when it comes to exercise and longevity. So Pareto's principle being the 80-20 rule. Um, it's not precisely 80-20 in this case, but the concept of putting in like, what's the minimal effort you need to put in to get like the maximal result. So if you look at the chart, like where does it start to, the slope starts to decline. It's about 21, 22 minutes a day of physical activity. And ideally okay. that physical activity is where you're actually getting your heart rate up, where it's a little bit labored to speak to somebody, right? And so that might be for some people, it might be just walking if they're not in great shape. For other people, it might be a brisk walk. And for someone in spectacular shape, that might be like a, a, a jog or a run. Uh, but doing about 21, 22 minutes a day is probably going to get you about 60% of the benefits from exercise. Then the question becomes, well, how can you get to like 80, 90, 100% of the benefits? And I think that people should consider a few things. One is um, the the cardiovascular side of things and the cardiovascular benefits. So we've already talked about VO2 max, for example, and trying to increase that. Um, the other is muscle. And we want to make sure we have adequate muscle, especially as we get older. So when you're hitting your every decade after you're hitting your your 30s and going to 40s and 50s and 60s, um, we're, we're losing a few percent per year of our strength and our muscle mass, but most importantly, our strength. And we want to try to um, prevent that as much as possible. And one of the better things to do is to actually build some muscle mass while we're younger, and it's easy to do so. So we have a bigger foundation from which we can lose some of that muscle mass. And we're also training some muscle memory so that when we do exercise in our later years, um, it's a little bit easier for us to gain that muscle mass. So I would say that everyone should consider um, um, exercises that are going to build some muscle and strength. And so what to do, it, it really comes down to the individual and what they're really into. I mean, um, swimming is fantastic. It's um, really no pressure on the joints. And if you're swimming, especially uh, like against a current or something like that, that can really um, stress the, the body in a good way and add to muscle mass. Um, weightlifting, obviously doing exercises like squats and deadlifts are, are very good for males and females and building that foundation and the core, um, and so on. Dancing is, is great. Now dancing is going to be a little bit less on the muscle mass though. Certain types of dance, I'm, I'm sure will do it more so than others, but, um, at least, you know, the physical activity, the cardiovascular and so on. Um, you can get it from dance. So it's really up to the individual and, and what, what they're going to be compliant with, what they're going to be motivated to do each day. Think about that first and then think about like, how can I optimize this even further? Yeah. Yeah. But it's good to know like the important, I guess, the, the, the little goals you said, like one is like heart rate, like cardio is important. And then in some sort of intense training <laughs> that kind of increases your ability to keep oxygen and use it. And then the third one is weightlifting, some sort of strength training. Exactly. And, and what you can consider also is um, the idea of the heart rate zones. So I don't want to uh, go into too much detail here, but there are, depending on your age and your cardiovascular fitness, there are different heart rate zones, one through five. And you know, if you're just walking, you're at one. Uh, heart rate zone two is the steady state cardio zone where people, especially if you're training for uh, athletic events, like you, you want to speed up your 5K or your uh, your marathon time or something, um, trainers encourage people to spend most of their time in zone two. That's building up the, the aerobic base. Um, and then uh, high intensity interval training is going to be in that zone five. I personally, my, my VO2 max doesn't increase in zone two. It only increases when I'm, I'm pushing myself in zone five and zone four. Uh, so I, I push myself a little bit more than the, um, you know, than someone training for a marathon would, um, into that zone four, zone five, high intensity stuff. But there is a lot of information out there on the web, uh, that people can look up and on YouTube as well about the different zones of cardio. And depending on what your goals are, um, you know, you might want to consider heart rate based training when it comes to cardio. 
Okay, so I, I do want to ask you about your company, Novos. I mean, what inspired you to start this company and what's your vision for it? Yeah, so you know, I, I kind of hinted at, at the inspiration between my brain tumor and then coming across that scientific paper that, that inspired me. It, it gave me a lens through which I could look at aging and understand that there are actual biological reasons why we get older and that we can have an impact on these different uh, biological uh, mechanisms. Then I started to go to biotech conferences and I started to meet the scientists whose papers I had been reading for years. And I started asking them questions about over-the-counter natural safe ingredients that were find, being found in, in research studies to have a favorable effect on these different mechanisms of aging. And I wanted to hear from them firsthand whether they were optimistic about these ingredients and saw potential behind them actually making an impact on the aging process, or if they thought that it was placebo or something that would really have no impact at all. And I was actually, I was, I was pleasantly surprised by how optimistic these researchers were about the potential of these ingredients. And then at the same time, I then asked them, what do you think of the idea of addressing all of the hallmarks of aging at the same time. There were at the time nine, there are now 12 as of last year. And uh, there was unanimous agreement that addressing all of the hallmarks of aging at the same time is going to have most likely the biggest impact on the aging process because all of these hallmarks, they impact one another. So if you have you know, excess oxidative stressors that are causing DNA damage, which can then um, lead to uh, the, you know, dysregulated epigenome, which then leads to so on and so forth. There, there's a cascading effect across all of these different hallmarks. And so if you're going to uh, impact just one or two, which is what scientific researchers and biotech companies were doing, they were only focusing on one or two because that, that's how science tends to function. It's a reductionistic discipline. You want to start super, super simple. But in practical terms, what's going to have the biggest impact? There is unanimous agreement, address them all at once. So that's when I realized that there was something not being done in the market. I wanted a product for myself. Like, I'll be honest, purely selfishly, like I wanted to take something, right? Uh, and then by extension, I wanted to do something for my family and friends and loved ones to, to provide them with something. And every all of the research being done in longevity is for biotechnologies that are years out in the future, are going to need to be proven safe, um, are going to be extremely expensive, and most people won't be able to afford. You'll require a doctor's prescription and oversight and so on. It's like, my family isn't going to do these types of things. What can I give them that they will do? And uh, so that's when I decided to start Novos. Novos is the first company in the world to address all 12 of the hallmarks of aging simultaneously. We're the most validated company as well. We've done a lot of scientific research at independent academic labs that run studies and in uh, check how effective our, our ingredients are, our formulations are um, at different um, success metrics related to the aging process, which we can talk about if you care to. Uh, we're a public benefit corporation, so I purposely established Novos this way so that we could do more for the public at large than uh, a typical company would. And so uh, the way that we do this is, for example, in addition to donating funds to different organizations and nonprofits and academic labs, uh, more practically speaking, we create tools and knowledge and resources for anyone in the world to be able to learn how to slow down their aging without buying a single thing. They don't have to purchase our formulations. They can integrate this into their own lives. So the way uh, a, a few of those tools, one most simply is our blog. It's uh, called Novos Flow. We've got over 200 scientifically referenced articles written by uh uh, PhDs and MDs. Second is a tool called FaceAge, which a lot of people have fun with. Uh, so FaceAge is an AI-powered tool that will tell you how young you look, and um, and then different skin health markers like wrinkles, uh, skin inflammation, pore size, uh, skin uniformity, and so on. Uh, it's the the AI is trained on millions of people's faces. It's very accurate. And we also then provide recommendations of things you can do to improve all of those scores. 
And it's relevant because as we, uh, if, if we have accelerated aging, uh, we talked about the epigenetic clocks before. If you have a higher pace of aging, for example, compared to someone with a lower pace of aging, researchers actually took the slowest aging people, 10, 10 of them, male and female, uh, the 10 average aging people and the 10 fastest aging people and used computer technology to merge their faces. And were able to um, create both male and female um, outputs of what people look like depending on how fast they're aging. And when I recently did a, a, a speech at a medical conference, I asked the audience of doctors to guess how old each of the people were. The slowest aging people, they guessed 35 years old. The average aging people, they got it right. They guessed 45 years old. That's how old they were. And then the fastest aging people, they guessed 55 years old. So if you compare the slowest to the fastest, that's a 20 year difference. 55 versus 35 years old is how they look visually. So this tool that we offer for free is actually correlated with biological aging. Um, and then finally, what we're releasing actually just next week is an app that we're very proud of. It's called Novos Life. It's 100% free. Uh, all of the features are also free. Uh, the first thing we offer is a biological age output for free. Now, this isn't based on blood. It's based on a survey, but this survey is AI based and it's actually been shown to be more accurate than the first generation epigenetic clocks like the Horvath clock. So it's very powerful. It's not as powerful as our Novos age test that I mentioned earlier, which is a blood based test, but it's in between the first generation blood based test and the Novos age test. So we want to provide that to as many people as possible for them to have an understanding of uh, where they find themselves with their biological aging. And then we don't leave them hanging. From there, we uh, will analyze lifestyle and we'll give recommendations for people of, we'll, we'll uh, categorize them like high importance and medium importance for lifestyle recommendations. And then based on those recommendations, we give daily actions. We give no more than three per day. And these are small steps you can take to try to achieve those specific recommendations. And those recommendations, if you fulfill them over time, are going to lead to a lower biological age. And then finally, the last feature in, in the launch version of the app is a chat GPT um, uh, integration, but it's trained on our data set. So all of our articles and customer uh, communication and so on, all of that is integrated into it. So people kind of have their own personal AI coach when it comes to longevity. Wow. And that's going to be free, everything in that app? Yes, it's all free. I think it's incredible how many resources that you take the time and effort to create, because I know it's not easy <laughs> doing all of these things, not just your product, but the digital, like the articles and the app. Those are separate like separate businesses on their own. But anyway, I think it's it's beautiful. And I, I'm so excited to try that. I'm so excited for that test. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we, we put, we, we have a lean team. There's only about uh, 15 of us uh, full-time. But uh, we we put a lot in and, and we're, we're uh, very detail-focused and uh, trying to bring the latest science. So, you know, we've got our, our team of, of world-renowned scientists from Harvard and MIT and uh, the Salk Institute who are guiding us on, on all of this and making sure that we're being accurate with the information that we provide to people and the guidance that we give and the formulations that we create. But it's um, a very rewarding um, experience working at, at Novos. And I, I think all of our, our team would say the same. I mean, we have very, very high employee retention rates. Everyone, we feel like a family with each other and we, we're really proud of the things that we put out. That's great. I'm so proud of you just hearing that. Like, I, I think you guys are at the forefront of this because this field is only, only going to grow and more and more people are going to learn about like all like longevity, biohacking. And the, the fact that you're just being so technological as well, incorporating AI is like so smart. I just think this is the future. <laughs> I'm witnessing something of the future. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, that's that's uh, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to invent the future. Yeah. All right. Um, so, Chris, we have time for one final message. If you have one final takeaway or message you want to leave the audience with today, what would that be? So I, I've said it already, but I want to emphasize it. The, the most important thing is for people to realize that aging is malleable. It is something that you can have an impact on. And the decisions that you make 
are going to either speed it up or slow it down. That is not as simple as just general health guidance, that there are specific things that within the field of health, very specific things that are going to have a a more pronounced impact on slowing down that rate of aging. And if no matter what your goals are, whether your goal is to live a very long life, if your goal is to try to avoid disease, if your goal is to look as good as you can for as long as you can look good, um, if your goal is to be as physically capable and mentally capable, any one of those, you're going to reap those benefits by looking at your health through the lens of longevity. Amazing. Thank you so much. And then lastly, where can we find you online? So my company, Novos, is novoslabs.com. And we're on all of the social networks as Novos Labs. Uh, You can also find our products most recently now, at least in California, at Erwan. They're our latest partner. And uh, my website is Slow My Age. That's where I post my personal results, my thoughts on the industry, and my lifestyle. And uh, I'm on TikTok, Instagram, and X as Slow My Age. Amazing. Thank you so much, Chris. This was so insightful. And again, I am proud of what you're doing. Excited for what's to come as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.